honored to um, introduce our program speakers today. I've had the privilege of working with these two gentlemen for the last number of years in my role as parish nurse in that partnership with uh, First United Methodist and First Presbyterian Churches. Um, two very different personalities. <laughs> And I really do admire and respect um, both of these guys. Fun, um, really um, a great resource to me in a professional mode, but both are funny. I catch John with stories of fishing and share stories with my kids and his interest and David with his uh, clever antics at church. But, um, but really a privilege to, to bring them both here together and show the collaboration of the church of the Gaston County. John Fry is a native of Robbins, North Carolina, in Moore County. Uh, he's a graduate of Northmore High School, Davidson College, Union Theological, and Columbia Theological Seminaries. He was married to the late Denise Stiebler Fry, and they have one son, John, who lives with his wife, Megan, and their two daughters in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Prior to entering seminary, John taught his school English at Pinecrest High School and served as the CEO of his family's business. Uh, he was involved in very, many civic roles there, including mayor of the town of Robbins. He served East Minster Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina, and Aiken Presbyterian Church prior to coming to First Presbyterian in Gastonia during the summer of 2007. He has served in this community on the boards of Crisis Assistance Ministry, the United Way, and the Glenn Foundation. He is a member of the Presbytery of Western North Carolina and has served as chair of the committee of ministry. He was also awarded the Alumni Service Award by Davidson College in 1995. David Christie was appointed Senior Minister of First United Methodist Church in July of 2012. He was born in Jefferson, North Carolina, in a parsonage family, so he grew up across Western North Carolina. His father, who is now deceased, was a minister, and his sister and two brothers are all in ministry in Western North Carolina. He graduated from Pfeiffer University with a BA and Duke Divinity School uh, with a Master's of Divinity. He is an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. Uh, he's married to Pam, who teaches at Whitewater uh, Elementary, and they have two children, Luke and Maggie. David has served on several boards here and agencies in our conference and in our community. Currently, he serves through the, Gaston the Gastonia Rotary, the Board of uh, Disciple Outreach Bible Ministries, and on the Conference Board of Ordained Ministry, West Carolina Conference. He has served as a delegate to the Southeast Jurisdiction and General Conference of the United Methodist Church. And it is my privilege to um, introduce our program today, John and David. decided we would talk to you about the four-way test, something we know nothing about. So, uh, <laughs> do know uh, now I'll tell you what we thought we would do is do a little bit of history. I, don't, I didn't know some of the history of the four-way test. I'm sure I'm supposed to, but uh, I guess I'm a poor rotary member. I am going to say to my colleague and friend, the first one is, is it the truth? And since we've already had a golf story today, <laughs> my understanding is that David uh, had a moment at Augusta National when he uh, bumped into somebody and they asked who he was and he introduced himself as John Fry from First Presbyterian Church. Somebody doesn't like him. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> well, you should tell the truth. We're all for that. So, uh, I am going to give you a little background on the four-way test. In some ways, in terms of how it helps us understand the roots of the rotary ethic. Uh, and I'm going to read some of this because I don't know it well enough. In the early 1930s, Herbert J. Taylor set out to save club aluminum distribution company from bankruptcy. And he really thought he was the only person in the company among about 250 employees who really thought that the company was salvageable. 
And he thought the first and most important thing to do was to salvage the ethical climate of the company. As a former businessman, I find that very appealing because we create cultures in companies, we create cultures in churches, we uh, create cultures in clubs that are the ones that poise us to fulfill the mission we have. And this is how he explained that using his word. The first job was to set policies for the company that would reflect the high ethics and morals God would want in any business. If the people who worked for Club Aluminum were to think right, they would do what they would do right. And what we needed was a simple, easily remembered guide to right conduct, a sort of ethical yardstick, which all of us in the company could memorize and apply to what we thought and to what we did. I searched through many books for the answer to our need, but the right phrases eluded me. So I did what I often do when I have a problem. I can't answer myself. I, I turned to the one who has all the answers. I leaned over my desk, rested my head in my hands, and prayed. After a few moments, I looked up and reached for a white paper card, and then I wrote down the 24 words that had come to me. And you know those words. What are they? This is the truth. Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? It's not bad, is it? Pretty, pretty good idea. And so he called it the four-way test of the things we think, do, and say. In the 1940s, when he was an international director for Rotary, he offered the four-way test to Rotary. And finally, in 1954, he actually turned the copyright for this four-way test over to Rotary International, even though he preserved the, the rights to use it in his company. And so it's been uh, adopted since then. But it is an interesting structure for an ethical foundation. So I just want to make a couple of brief comments about it as a, a structure for ethics. I don't know about you, I've always been intrigued with business ethics. You know, there, there are two ways that we do ethics. First way we do it is what's called Kantian ethics. We contemplate what our motives are. We try to figure out why we do what we do and doing the right thing for the right re reasons matters, doesn't it? The other way we do ethics, we do utilitarian ethics. We try to say, how is this going to turn out? What is the bottom line? What is the end result? So that when we're doing ethics well, we are thinking about what our motives are and we're thinking about the outcome. I'm biased, I think that's Christian ethics. But um, when we get to that, I think there are reasons we do ethics in a dialogue like that. The, um, the Greeks always had an interesting idea about the human soul, and I promise I won't take long with this. They saw the human soul as having three parts. One part of it was the appetites, or they called it the appetitive will, those things that attract us, those things that draw us in. Then another one was what they called the irascible will. I, I would call it the fears, those things that repel us. And the way the soul worked, there, there were those things that attracted us. There were those things that repelled us. And they, they looked at that like it was a chariot drawn by two horses. And the charioteer was reason. The one that would kind of rein in the appetites. The one that would try to apply the whip to the fears and kind of keep the chariot in the middle of the road. 
And you know how that plays out when we think about um, our vices and our virtues. If I say to you, you know, what is the, what is the cure for pride? What's the cure for pride? Humility. Humility. So what we do is we have, if we're talking about gluttony, we're going to talk about moderation. If we're going to talk about greed, we're going to talk about generosity. And so that's a way of talking about ethics that balances it as well. What we end up in this, uh, with in this, is a way of doing ethics that way. Uh, Thomas Merton, with our first question, is it the truth, makes an interesting comment about truth. Thomas Merton, in his essay, No Man is an Island, says we make ourselves real by telling the truth. But we can also forget how much we need to, uh, to tell that truth. We must be true inside, true ourselves, before we can know a truth that is outside of us. You know, part of the nature of truth is before we're going to act in truth in the world, we have to figure out what that is. In fact, so to ask of ourselves, is it the truth, is an important, an important starting place for us in the ethical exercise. So are we going to contemplate what is real and appropriate and the like? Are we going to keep ourselves grounded as people in terms of our action in the world? That's the basis for integrity where the person we are inside matches the person who acts and lives and functions in the world. The, uh, if we talk about fairness, you know, both of those, if it's truth or if it's fairness, those are both very subjective. It's going to depend on our perspective to interpret those. But what is the, what's the real interest in that? The interest is in terms of equity, to try to do what is right, isn't it? To try to treat people the same way. Or if we start to talk into, I'm going to flip-flop, if we talk about benefits, to try to think in terms of how things turn out. We're dealing not just with motive, but we're dealing with the end result. And if we start to think in terms of relationships, my sense is if we will deal with integrity, if we will deal uh, with folks in terms of uh, uh, fairness, if we will deal with folks in terms of uh, being beneficial, and if we deal with folks in terms of goodwill, at the end of the day, we in fact have better relationships in the world. So, as a brief thing, while it is not going to make theologians or ethicists particularly happy, it nonetheless is a good, quick litmus for how we think, do, and act in the world. how much I love and respect John Fry, and I know those of you from First Presbyterian and all of us in this community appreciate his leadership and his integrity in being who he is, and we thank you, sir. Um, and, and John and I talked a little bit uh, about this, obviously, we do talk. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I agree, I think this is, this four-way test is a great basis for relationships, um, for, uh, for what is important, the buzz in business and other things is keep your mission in front of you, never forget who you are, right? Well, every week when we come and we have these questions, which after three and a half years I almost have memorized, I only on a few of them, um, but I, I mean they're great. 
that's what we are to be about. And, and I would submit to you that in this day and age when people say folks don't join civic clubs, folks don't join churches, folks don't join things anymore, that's why the Rotary Club of Gastonia is significant and why we fill a room like this. Uh, are there any recovering Lions here? I was Lions Club president in Canton. When, oh, so it's just me. Well, okay, Don, thank you. Uh, we got a few of us. And the Lions Club has a great motto, we serve. That's awesome, isn't it? The first place I lived as a minister was um, uh, a little mill town in Randolph County called Franklinville. Anybody ever been through Franklinville, right on Highway 22? Town that time forgot, but Rust remembered. A great <laughs> place to live. It really is a great place. And I've always believed when you go to a community, you ought to be involved in it. So that was it. There was a Lions Club, and they met in the fellowship hall of our church. So I joined the Lions Club, and I was 25% of the Lions Club. And there were four guys, I brought the average age, I was 24 at the time, I brought the average age down to 89. <laughs> and we met and we ate. And we talked about who we were going to get to cook the next meal. And every year the district governor came around, just like they do in Rotary, and the district governor would say, what are y'all doing? And one of the heroes of my life, a man named D.S. Thomas, would stand up, and I kid you not, he carried this big book of all things Lionism, but we didn't do anything. And he would go, well, we, this, I, what, this, get it, And the district governor would go, all right, well, thank you all. And I mean, I was like, he didn't say anything. We don't do anything. And, and we wondered why we just had four members, right? Uh, people want, need to know what we are about. And I am so grateful for a civic club like Rotary that tells us what we are about in the tribe that I'm a part of, Methodism started over 230 years ago. Uh, before the Civil War, there was one Methodist church being built per day. Today, 2015, there is one Methodist church closing per day. That's not unique to Methodists. All of us mainliners can go, woo, yeah, we're dying too. Um, because, and I would submit, there, there was a philosopher who said, the idea creates the institution, and the institution destroys the idea. Somewhere along the line, we forgot our mission. Somewhere along the line, we got into arguments about the color of carpet, uh, and, you know, no offense if this uh, goes to your church, but if the shoe fits, wear it. Uh, we, you know, we started arguing about things that just don't matter. And we forgot our mission. Um, Wesley, who was the founder of Methodism, I would say the reason that the church was growing was, first of all, they went out to where people were. And they preached. It's a really cool thing to do. Instead of saying, come to our big stone building, sit down, shut up, and we'll wake you up when it's time to leave. <laughs> they went to people and preached and told them about the good news. And then they said, listen, we want you to be a part of a small group. We want you to be a part of a class. And the question of the class is this. How is it with your soul? That's it. No color or carpet. How is it with your soul? And then you had to belong to a band, and there were five questions. The first one was, what known sins have you committed since our last meeting? How'd you like to go to that meeting? Right? <laughs> what temptations have you met with? How were you delivered? What have you thought, said, or done of which you doubt whether it be sin or not? And finally, have you nothing you desire to keep secret? I mean, they were really clear. This is what we are about. 
This is who we are. I am grateful for what Rotary does because we ask ourselves these questions. It, it is not rocket science. I mean, it, it really isn't. It's basic, as John said, this is what makes relationships matter. This is what makes us matter in the community. I am proud to be a Rotarian. Uh, after 20 years of lionism, and I was proud to be a lion, although we didn't do anything. <laughs> I was proud to be a lion. I made my news. I'm not sure where the news went. Uh, but, but I feel, it, it, I, I think people want to know that what we do matters, that, that something makes a difference. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to ask these questions every week. And after a while, I, you know, when you join, they give you the little plaque and it's right over my computer. And it takes me a while because it's not only a watermelon head, it's thick too. But you, you actually find yourself starting to ask, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And uh, you know, you find yourself doing that. And that's not a bad thing. Even for people who claim Jesus Christ. It ain't a bad thing uh, to, to get serious about that. So thank you all for being a part of Rotary. Thank you for being a part of a group that matters and does make a difference and, and that keeps it simple. We can do all the things we want, all the activities we want, and there always will be a million ways to do them. We can give out bikes probably 40 different ways. And if we got 40 of us in a room, we'd have 40 different ideas. But it comes down to those questions, right? And uh, thus ended the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I guess.